let's look at engine cycles. There's um, there's sometimes a, a misconception, or it seems a bit disjointed at first, where we have, or you know, in our study of internal combustion engines, where we have on the one hand PV diagrams, uh, right, where I would see the so here's the exhaust phase intake, and then we have compression and combustion ooh, like this. So we have our PV diagram. And on the other hand, we have our uh, torque and power curves like this. So this would be RPM, and then this is torque, power, and whatever units we want. Actually, let's look at a, um, let's look at a specific example. Let's just go here. So we have an example. This is from, uh, I think this was this from a few years back. I think this was from a Honda Fit. Um, is the so we have the specifications of the engine uh, here we have you know specifications uh, operational specifications like the maximum horsepower or the maximum torque at a given rpm uh, the maximum uh, the maximum power at a certain rpm the maximum torque at a certain rpm um, and we could have so here we're showing this is for a different this for a different engine uh, this is an example that's actually from one of the, the textbooks that we use in the class and uh, so we see that as we vary our um, engine speed uh, or the, the RPM of the engine, we have a certain variation of torque. And so this is for two different sized engines. So the, the um, full black line for torque is here on top. This is torque. This is a different, this is our smaller engine. This is the 2.5 liters. And then we have the corresponding power curves to these torque curves. And here we have whatever, I just pulled out. This is again, an example from one of our uh, textbooks. We have a particular, uh, we have a particular PV diagram where we see the variation of pressure with volume and we could integrate this and actually, or we could take a, a, a ruler and actually measure out what is the area inside the PV curve. And that area gives me the work in the cycle. Now we've reconnected these two things. Um, well, this is in one cycle, and I know the cycle takes n r revolutions. Right? If it's a four-stroke engine, it takes two revolutions to do a full cycle. So I can connect the work done in one cycle with the work done in one revolution, which is just the work done per cycle divided by n r. So a four-stroke engine is divided by two. Two-stroke engine, it's the same number because every cycle gives me, or every revolution gives me a full cycle. And if we have the work done in one revolution, um, Hold on, well, that is almost a torque, right? We said the torque is basically the work done per radian. So we actually, in one revolution is two pi radian. So then I know that the torque of my engine is the work done in a revolution divided by two pi. And then I can connect back. This is, I can connect this to the power, all right, W dot or, or P is the power developed by the engine. And now that power is, well, it's just two pi times the torque times N, the revolution, the revolution speed, or it's just the work done per revolution times the number of revolutions per time. Um, so basically if we pick a certain condition, so if I pick a certain condition, a certain engine speed N, and then I can ask the question, well, at that engine speed, what is the, what does the PV diagram look like? Uh, getting the PV diagram, then I can do the cycle, getting the work done in the cycle, and the revolution to torque the power, and then I can draw two points. I can draw one point here, and then I would go, so I'll put in X, I have one torque point, and then I have one power point corresponding to this particular engine speed. And then I could pick, so at 5,000 revolutions per minute, here is the corresponding torque, multiply that by N, here's a corresponding power. So we can redo this calculation, or I can I can basically pick I can pick a lot of values of n, deduce what is from physics, what is the PV diagram that corresponds to each of these values of n, integrate to get the work, and then I can plot for each of these values of n. I can then plot points along the torque curve and then along the power curve and basically reconstruct these diagrams. Um, now, of course, these diagrams are obtained. If I put the engine on a dyno, then I can directly measure what the output is and I can plot these, I can plot these two curves directly. 
And so this is what we want to compare. We want to calculate from physics, from basics physics, I want to calculate how does this PV diagram look like and see if I'm able to get a reasonable agreement with our torque and power curves. Oh, let me just get my notes back up. So let me erase these drawings. Um, okay. We're going as this uh, as we go through the different physical mechanisms. We're going to include more and more effects, but we could start with instead of a real uh, cycle, we could start with an idealized cycle. So here's my volume. In this case, I've put in specific volume, but it doesn't matter. And if I have, well, it's a spark ignited engine. Then my idealized cycle looks like this. So I can take my idealized cycle and then ask what is the what is the work done in one cycle. Um, we do this, so for ideal, actually for idealized cycle or for real cycle, we're gonna do this the same way, is we're going to calculate uh, basically the PV curve for different processes and, uh, and then reassemble all the four processes in order to get the work done in the cycle. Um, it's a bit easier to do it on pen and paper with, um, with the idealized cycle because the processes are easily they're sort of easily cuttable like i can i can cut these i know that from state one to two it's purely isentropic compression and then from state two to three it's purely heat release then from state three to four it's purely isentropic expansion and then from state four to one it's a purely it's a single process in a real cycle these um these different effects go over each other. So here's my state one. Here I have, well, if I have heat transfer, it's no longer isentropic, but I have compression. And then before the compression is over at this point, you see this little X here. This is where uh, ignition, well, it's noted here. This is where ignition occurs. And then I have combustion. So over a certain portion here, I'm going to hatch up, hatch up in red. Over this portion, I have both compression and heat release happening at the same time. I'm going to hatch it out in blue over this portion up until the maximum of pressure. This is where combustion is over. I have both expansion and heat release happening at the same time. And then afterwards I have uh, isentropic or I have expansion with heat transfer happening over that portion of the cycle. So there's not a, there's not as clear cut of, of a, a stop between the different processes but I can still define regions when different processes occur, and we're going to learn how to um, how to model these different uh, these different parts of the process. Okay, um, let's do this. Let's do this example first uh, for a idealized process. So I'm going to pick an operating condition uh, like so, and then I'm going to ask, well, what is the what is then the um, the torque and here the curve should come down and the power at these conditions. Let us, there we go. Um, so this is a repeat of what our, our idealized cycles are, so our basic thermal tool. Um, let's see. So we start with idealized cycle and one of the, I mean, the main, um, the main, uh, what do you call this? Oh. So the main um, approximation is the air standard uh, thermodynamic cycle approximation, where we assume that the, the mixture inside the cylinder is always air, purely air. There's no, uh, there's no fuel uh, in there. Um, and then uh, the CP and CV and K are constants. Um, and there is no heat transfer. So any compression expansion is going to be um, isentropic. And the... Um, the heat transfer occurs, uh, or the heat addition occurs instantly. There is no time taken, taken for, for this particular process. Um, here we're just reviewing. So these are the first, the four stages of the four strokes of, um, of the, uh, in this particular case of the spark ignited engine. So I'm just going to skip this. Um, and I'm going to skip a few slides there. So I want to basically do this analysis for an idealized cycle. So actually here, let me stop the share. I'm going to open up it. I'm going to open up a whiteboard. There we go. Okay. 
So let's calculate. So if we have, uh, oops, if we have an idealized cycle, oops, cycle uh, starting at P1, uh, P, well, P1 and T1, well, that is, but an initial in pressure and temperature, I'm going to assume that I know these values, uh, then what's the work? Oh, here, I have to give a little bit more information uh, also, and gaining Q in kilojoules per kilogram of heat release or, or of heat through the heat release or through combustion, what's the work done? What's the work? What's the efficiency? I'm going to ask all of these questions at once. What's the torque? What's the power? Okay. So I like to draw my PV diagram. In this case, it's an idealized cycle. We'll go from state one, two, heat input, three, four. And at this point, this should be a review. If you look at our video, uh, I think it's topic zero, is a review of the idealized cycle. So for state one or for path one to two, for process one to two, this is now, there's no heat, uh, there's no heat uh, exchange. This is an isentropic compression. Isentropic compression. And in this particular case, we have been told that this is, since this is an ideal gas with constant CP, CV, and K, then I can use my isentropic relations because it's an ideal gas. So in this case, I'm going to have P2 specific volume at 2 to the K is equal to P1 V1 to the K. This gives me P2 is equal to P1. And then V1 over V2, that's the compression ratio, the compression ratio to the K. So I can calculate P2. And then I can also write the same or something similar for T2. T2 V2 to the K minus 1 is equal to T1 V1 to the K minus 1. This gives me T2 is equal to T1 R to the K minus 1. So if I know what the initial pressure and temperature are, then I can find what the pressure and temperature are after compression at state 2. And then I could also compute the work. So I have my, so at state 1, I have this uncompressed, this is my state 1, I have this uncompressed slug of gas, and then I compress it, and I end up with tiny volume, this is at state 2, my cylinder shrinks, uh, if that is my system, then I know that the change in internal energy is equal to Q in minus the work done from 1 to 2, and let's see, well, it's isentropic, so it's adiabatic, so there is no heat transfer, and then I find that the work done from 1 to 2 is equal to the negative of delta U, the negative of the change of internal energy, delta U is internal energy at the end minus the internal energy at the beginning, U2 minus U1, and this is so equal to U1 minus U2, and it's an internal, uh, sorry, it's an ideal gas, so I'm going to get that the work done is the mass inside the uh, system, that is the mass, the amount of mass inside my cylinder, multiplied by CV delta T. A change in internal energy is for an ideal gas is CV delta T. So CV T1 minus T2. Okay. From two to three. Actually, I'm, I'm going to put a note here because in the next video, I'm going to discuss this. These two equations here, these two ideal gas, uh, yeah, ideal gas relations. Remember, these are, these are derived from the first law, the first and the second law of thermo. So these two equations there, they're not something in addition to thermodynamics. Those are thermodynamics. All I did was to write down the first law, consider an isentropic process, in which case delta Q goes to TDS, and then I took that, uh, that term out, and then I considered what's the work done for fluid, it's PDV. I shoved everything in, and then I just rearranged it a little bit 
and that allowed me to integrate it and I got PV to the K is equal to a constant. You can go from PV to the K is equal to a constant to TV to the K minus one equal to, uh, is equal to a constant using the ideal gas law of PV is equal to RT just to eliminate pressure. So this is, there is nothing new. There's no new bit of physics in using the isentropic relation. It is just a process evaluated under the first and the second law of thermodynamics. Process two to three is heat addition. Um, so now I don't like to just write down that equation for some reason. These are, are, are my isentropic relations are kind of long to derive. So I like to remember those by heart or to write them out somewhere. But for heat addition, it's actually pretty quick. So, so here, I'm just going to write the first law. So now I have, at state two, I have my system. It's this little squished cylinder. At state three, it's still, it's gotten squished. At state three, it's still the same volume. It's still squished, except it's all burnt. And now I've added heat and it's, it's at a much higher pressure and temperature. So first law for that system says that the change in internal energy, which is going to be U3 minus U2, is equal to the amount of heat added minus the work done from two to three. The work is zero because there's no change in volume, right? This work is equal to the integral of PdV. But if we go from V2 to V2, because it's the same volume, it's constant volume combustion, then this whole term there just disappears. Uh, U3 minus U2, I said this is the mass of the system multiplied by, it's a change in internal energy, so it's CV delta T, T3 minus T2, is equal to Q in, the amount of heat that's released. And I said I'm, I'm given some amount of, here I'm going to put little Q, so some amount of Q per kilogram. So this is just the mass of the system multiplied by Q in. There we go. And I can cancel out these two. So then I have T3 is equal to... T2 plus QN over CV. And that, that little QN is like reasonable numbers for this is like uh, 2,000 kilojoules per kilogram of mix, all of the amount of mass inside the system. Or a reasonable number for fuels is like 40 to 45 megajoules per kilogram of fuel, of just the fuel. And what's the total mass inside the system? It's equal to the mass of the air plus the mass of the fuel. And let's see, it's equal to the mass of the air plus mass of the fuel. And we've seen in a previous video, uh, a dimensionless number called the air fuel ratio, which is the mass of air over the mass of fuel. So I can rewrite this. This is the mass of the system is equal to mass of air plus, uh, let's see, I want the mass of fuel in the end. So I'm going to put a mass of air times the mass of fuel over the mass of air. So mass of the system is equal to the mass of air times one plus and then I have the mass of fuel over the mass of air. That's the fuel-air ratio, which is one over the air-fuel ratio, which is what I actually prefer. So that, um, so let's see. The, so the mass of this system is equal to mass of air times one plus one over the air-fuel ratio. I like it like this because the, the air fuel ratio is a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big number. Oh yes. Okay. So now let me, um, so this, this is a little Q in is typically 2000 around this, or this is what we call QHV. This is the heating value of the fuel. This is how much energy is liberated by burning all of the, all of the molecules that are in the fuel only. So if it's uh, heptane, then it's uh, every carbon in C7H, whatever, is broken down into CO2 and all of the hydrogens go to H2O. Um, but in this equation here, I really have to put, it's Q in. It's the amount of heat input per, um, 
per kilogram of mix. So little Qn, this is equal to all of the heat that's been released, which would be in this case, the mass of fuel times QHV divided by the mass of fuel plus air, the mass of the system like this. Aha, cool. Okay, I can, I can use, I can use that equation over here to shove it into there. Look what I can do. I want, well, here I have mass of air, but it's okay. I could multiply this by mass of fuel over the mass of fuel. That's equal to one. And then I'm going to get, this is going to give me the mass of the system is equal to mass of air over mass of fuel. That's the air fuel ratio times one plus one over the air fuel ratio times the mass of fuel. Yes, that's right. So the mass of fuel over, so I get mass of fuel over the mass of the system is equal to one over, so air fuel ratio times one is equal to air fuel ratio plus air fuel ratio times one over the air fuel ratio is just one. There we go. So I can rewrite this. So Q in is really equal to, and now that, um, that ratio I found here. So it's equal to the heating value of the fuel divided by one plus the air fuel ratio. And for now it's okay to just remember sort of how big the air fuel ratio roughly is. Um, but so for gasoline, an ideal value is somewhere between 14 and 16. That's the ideal value. Uh, actual values, I like to run fuel lean, are going to be somewhere between 18 and 20, roughly, or like 16 to 20, somewhere in that range. And for diesel, for class of diesel fuel, uh, again, ideal is it's somewhere between 14 and, and 16. It's about, it's about the same as for gasoline, but in actuality, I'm going to burn much, much leaner. It turns out this is one of the big uh, advantages of, uh, of the diesel cycle is I'm going to burn in like, like 20 to 70. I'm going to have a huge range of the air fuel ratio. One takeaway, that's the typical numbers for the air fuel ratio. One takeaway is these numbers are pretty big. Yeah, they're like 10, 20, 50, order 10 to 100. Um, hence the heating value is very big, right? 40 to 45 megajoules per kilogram of fuel. That's right. And Q in is like 2000 kilojoules per kilogram of mix, which is two megajoules. So if I take my 40 to 45 and I divide it by roughly 20, then I get, what is this? Yeah. 40 divided by 20 is about two. That's right. So that works out. Okay, so even if, if I don't have, so if I don't have this particular number, if I know what fuel I'm using and if I know the air fuel ratio that I'm running at, then if I know the air fuel ratio that I'm running at, then I can work out what QN is and then I can find T3. Uh, I can also find P3, so I know that P3, V3, I know the ideal gas holds, P3, V3 is equal to the mass of the system times R specific T3. And I know this also, let me just, let me just lower down my equal sign a little bit. Equal, because I'm going to make a ratio out of this. So I know this ideal gas also holds at state two. So I can divide on both sides by the respective sides of the ideal gas law, R specific T2. Um, from two to three, the volume is constant. The mass, it's a closed system. The mass is always constant. And specific R is just a function of the, specific R is a function of the material. Um, so that's equal to T3 over T2. This is equal to P3 over P2. Awesome. So with the knowledge of how much heat I'm releasing, I can find T3. And knowing T3 and T2, then I can find P3 and P2. Awesome. Okay. Uh, now all I have left is state or process three to four. I'm going to make some room. I'm going to erase state one to two. I 
actually, let me see, can I select? There we go. And then can I delete this? Nope. Wait, okay. Here, I'm just going to do this slowly. Okay, I'm just going to erase this here just to make some room. Okay, so state three to four, or process three to four. Um, this is, again, it's isentropic expansion. Here it says not correct. Yes is equal to zero expansion. So in this case, uh, I know that P4, V4 to the K is equal to P3, V3 to the K. This gives me that P4 is equal to P3 times. It looks a lot like the compression. It's just that now instead of going from a big volume to a small volume, go the other way. So it's going to be a 1 over R to the K. And similarly for temperature, T4 is equal to T3, uh, 1 over R to the K minus 1. And I can write the first law again for this system. Now my system at 4 is just my big, my big system. So I write the first law for these, the transfer between those two systems. I know that delta U is equal to Q in. This is zero minus the work from three to four. So work from three to four is going to be equal to minus delta U is going to be equal to U3 minus U4 is equal to mass of the system CV T3 minus T4. Like this. Okay. And now the work from three to four is greater than zero because the temperature at three is much higher than the temperature at four. And the work from one to two is less than zero because the temperature at one is much lower than the temperature at two. All right, so now I can ask, well, what's the, what's the net, um, what's the net amount of work done in the cycle? Then it's the work done over each of the processes that compose the cycle. So the net amount of work is equal to the work from one to two, plus there's no work from two to three, plus the work from three to four, and there's no work from four to one. So it's the mass of the system, CV, and work from 1 to 2, we said is T1 minus T2. The work from 3 to 4 plus T3 minus T4, like this. Um, the net amount of heat input is equal to the mass of the system times Q in, which we have worked out. I've erased it now, but we said this is equal to uh, the mass of the system times Q in. This is going to be the mass of the system times CV, the change in temperature, T3 minus T2, like that. Okay. So if, if I have P1, T1, and the amount of heat that I input into this system, then I know the net amount of work done. This is actually the work done in the cycle. I can as well, uh, I can calculate what the efficiency is. Let's see if we can do it. I often get uh, every other time that I derive this, I get confused in my algebra. So we'll see if I can do it this time. So the efficiency of the cycle is going to be equal to the net amount of work. This is the net useful output over the cost that I had to pay, which is the total heat input. So it's going to be the mass of the system times CV, T1 minus T2 plus T3 minus T4 divided by the mass of the system, CV T3 minus T2. Mass of the system is the same all the time. CV is CV. If CV is CP and K are constants, this is the same value throughout the entire cycle. And that's it. This is the, this is the whole thing. OK. So that means this is equal to a ratio of temperatures. T1 minus T2 plus T3 minus T4 over T3 minus T2. There we go. Um, yes. So there's a few ways. There's a few ways to go about this. Ada is going to see if we can do it. I'm going to pull out a T. Oh. Well, actually, hold on. So T1. Um, Let's see. So 
So we're going to do the following. I cheated a little bit. We're going to do the following transformation. Uh, oh, undo. Okay. Uh, oh, so here, look here, we have a T3 minus T2. So I'm going to rewrite this. This is T1 minus T4 plus T3 minus T2. Divide everything by T3 minus T2. And now I'm going to have T3 minus T2 over T3 minus T2. This is 1 plus T1 minus T4 over T3 minus T2. So it gives me an efficiency, which is equal to 1. Here, I'll put a minus sign. I know what's coming. I'm going to put a minus sign and then revert just the top part, T4 over minus T1 over T3 minus T2. And then I'm going to pull out, so 1 minus. So on the top, I'm going to pull out a T1. And on the bottom, I'm going to pull out a T2. And so on the top, I'm going to get a T4 over T1 minus 1 divided by. And on the bottom, I'll get a T3 over T2 minus 1. Okay, and then I'm going to rewrite this T4 over T1. This is going to become 1 minus. Well, T1 over T2, I actually know what that is. T1 over uh, T1 over T2, that is directly related to the compression ratio, right? It's, the, it's how high the temperature goes with respect to the initial temperature through an isentropic compression. This becomes 1 over R to the K minus 1. Zook, and then T4 over T1, this is T4 over T3. T3 over T2, T2 over T1, minus 1, over T3 over T2, minus 1. All right. And if you look, T4 over T3, that was equal to 1 over R to the K minus 1. T2 over T1, that's equal to R to the K minus 1. So these two terms cancel out. And then everything in this bracket is just equal to 1. I got T3 over T2 minus 1 on the top, T2 over T2 minus 1 on the bottom. This all goes away. This is all equal to 1. Um, oh boy, this is very, I'm going to make a little bit of room. There is a good, there we go. Up. Oh, hold on. Let me come back. I'm going to keep this. Okay. So now we have the efficiency of the cycle is equal to 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1. So you have the derivation for all of the other types of cycle um, that we know of. There's basically four different ones that we, uh, that we look at in this course. So that's the efficiency. I know that the network in the cycle is equal to mass in the system CV. Uh, whoop, what did I say? T1 minus T2 plus T3 minus T4. Or I could rewrite this. Well, the network in the system, this is also going to be equal to uh, the mass in the system times Q in. Q in, like this, multiplied by eta. So multiplied by the efficiency, 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1. Just by definition of what the, the, uh, the efficiency actually is. Awesome. I could ask for what is the value of the mean effective pressure? Um, oh, well, hold on. I should say uh, the mass of the system. Um, well, I put, we can calculate this as just the initial density times the initial volume. And the initial density, row one, if it's an ideal gas, that means this is P1 V1 over R specific T1. That's the initial mass of the system. So here I'll write it. This is P1 V1 over R specific T1 times Q in times 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1. Okay. What's the mean effective pressure? Well, I know the definition of the mean effective pressure is going to be how much, uh, what pressure would give me the equivalent, what pressure would give me the equivalent amount of work in a square 
area like this. So the mean effective pressure times the displacement volume, VD, oops, go back to black, which is equal to mean effective pressure times V1 minus V2, which is equal to the mean effective pressure multiplied by V1 multiplied by one minus the small volume of the big volume one over R. This is V2 over V1. This is equal to the net amount of work in the cycle, which we said is P1 V1 over R specific T1 Q in times one minus one over R to the K minus one. Um, I can cancel out the V1. Ooh, this is awesome. Oh, well, hold on. You know me. Just so the mass will work out. So I'm going to cancel out the V1s. So that means that the mean effective pressure is equal to, so the V1s are going to go, it's going to be P1 over R specific T1. I have a Q in 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1. And then I have, so inside this bracket, this is R minus 1 and extend this division over R. So that means I can multiply by R over R minus one. And we can probably make this a bit fancier. We could make this a fancier bracket here, but essentially this is it. This is the, this is the mean effective pressure of the four stroke spark ignited cycle, um, of the four stroke spark ignited cycle uh, idealized, air standard, uh, yeah, and so on. Okay, well, that means I can also calculate, I can calculate uh, the torque. So we've said, here, I'm gonna put a bit of room. There we go. So we said the torque is just equal to the work done in one cycle divided by the number of revolutions in a cycle. That's the number of, that's the amount of work per revolution. And I'm gonna divide by two pi to get the amount of work done per radian. Yeah. Which, where do we have it? So this is equal to, so the torque and yeah, where's my work? It's gonna be P1 V1 over R specific T1. Q in times one minus one over R to the K minus one. That's the amount of work done in one cycle. Uh, I'm gonna divide by two times two pi, so divided by four pi, one over four pi. And that is the amount of work done in one cycle. If I know the initial pressure and temperature, the heat input and, uh, and the compression ratio, and I need to know one extra thing. It's I need to know V1. I need to know the size of the engine. Um, yes, that, that's kind of inevitable because if I have a half liter engine or a 16 liter engine, then obviously the amount of torque that I get is gonna be vastly different. Uh, if I want the power for that engine, then I go two pi times the torque times N. So in this uh, particular case, it's gonna be N over two right, two pi n over four pi, you see n over two, p1 v1 over r specific t1, q in one minus one over r to the k minus one. Okay. All of this to come out to this relation. So now I can build a torque and power curve with my idealized cycle. So if I, if I'm gonna draw my axes, here we have N, here I have, let's see, torque. Uh, so torque is this left equation over here. Um, well, for a given engine of a given size, if the initial pressure and temperature aren't affected by the rotational speed of the engine, and the amount of heat that I dump, I'm assuming it's an idealized cycle, the amount of heat that I'm dumping in it is also not affected by uh, the amount of, war of uh, at the speed at which the engine is running, then everything else is a, is a constant. Right? V1 is the size of the engine, that, that's, that's actually a constant. And R is also a, a constant, it's the geometry of the, the crank and everything. 
So that means that no matter which value of n that I pick, here's my value of torque, it's always going to be constant. So actually for the idealized cycle, the torque doesn't depend on n. And then for the power, well, it's basically this value multiplied by two pi n, not basically, it actually exactly is. So it's gonna be a little bit higher. So here I'm gonna put, well, let's be fancy. So here, this is the torque curve. And then on the, I have a right axis power. And then the power is gonna be zook like this. It's just gonna be a straight line with L and N. So this is the torque, this is the power. And that's the answer. Now I was able to get this from the idealized cycle. Now the question we have to answer is, okay, now what if, um, well, how do we get this to match? How do we get this to match our, um, our real measurement, right? Which looks like that. There's a, this goes down and then the power goes like this. So how do we get these two curves to match? Well, we have to include more physical processes on top of, uh, on top of just isentropic compression and heat addition. But this gives us a, ba a, a baseline actually that we can uh, work against.